So we heard uh, Jeff Wachowski talk a little bit about PFAS in the previous panel. Um, so our next panel, appropriately titled, is the Forever Chemical PFAS, a Forever Class Action. And you know, many of you should sure you know that PFAS class actions typically involve claims for personal injury, property damage, or both. Uh, the claims in these cases may allege that they were exposed to PFAS through contaminated water, air, or soil, or through the use of products containing these chemicals. Um, leading this discussion will be uh, Thomas Rossman, uh, co-head of the Product Liability and Mass Court Group at Hunton. Uh, he'll be joined by two of his colleagues, uh, Jack Escalia and Brian Ledger. And also, um, uh, from Gordon Reese, um, sorry, I'm not going to your name. Paul, Paul, Nif Paul Niffler from Hunton, and then Brian is with Gordon Fix. Uh, Brian is from Gordon Fix, sorry about that. Okay, so take it away, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tom Osmond, as you heard. First, I want to thank uh, Bernard and the rest of the beer group for having us here today. And I think uh, we were lucky to be able to, to present uh, just after the Warriors and Cross Cowards, because I think it, it really does segue very well. Um, what we're going to walk through today is uh, first, I'm just going to kind of level set with a very high level background on PFAS, just so we have some, some baseline of what we're talking about. Uh, Brian is going to discuss uh, kind of some developments in consumer class actions involving PFAS and Prop 65 issues out of California. Uh, you're going to hear from Paul, who will discuss some state and federal regulatory developments uh, that affect the ongoing classification and what's going to happen next. And then Jack will talk about some overall trends in PFAS litigation including what's going on right now in the PFAS MDL in South Carolina. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of background, as you heard, um, I am with Hunter Bryan is a, uh, not only the co-head of the environmental group at Gordon and Reese, but also has a background in masters in epidemiology and toxicology. Uh, Paul also is a scientist, Paul has a PhD in chemistry and, and has research uh, these chemicals, and Jack Australia, an associate in Mount in Richmond, Virginia, with Hunt and, and Jack, has been deeply involved in some of the class actions about PFAS pending in uh, Georgia, Alabama, and elsewhere. Um, so, PFAS generally, these are family of chemicals uh, that have very strong carbon chlorine bonds. Uh, the, the properties that make them most useful in products are also the properties that make them particularly problematic in the environment. They are extremely hydrophilic, lipophilic, um, they are very water soluble, lipid soluble, and they are very uh, resilient. They do not degrade over time and they move quickly through groundwater. Um, the most researched chemicals are PFOA and PFAS. So this is perfluorooctanoic acid and perfluorooctane sulfonic acid. Uh, when you hear people talk about PFAS in the environment, PFAS in litigation, these are the two chemicals that you hear about most often because these are the chemicals that were manufactured most widely. But in fact, these two chemicals are really a, a very small part of the overall PFAS family. So one of the difficulties that you're going to hear uh, is regulating these chemicals when they're really just the, the truly the tip of the iceberg. Um, where are they? they? They are literally ubiquitous. Um, PFAS at this point in the country is just about anywhere that you are. Um, certainly including this room, almost certainly including your bloodstream. Um, they have at this point made their way throughout the environment through water systems, um, they are Superfund sites, they are rivers, they are lakes. Um, they are very difficult to clean up. Uh, you, you'll see in this graphic here, um, once they get into kind of this feedback loop, they tend to stay in. And when they make their way to people, they tend to stay in people as well. Um, going through very quickly, well, why do we care? Um, we care because there appear to be health effects. Um, the research that has been conducted thus far into the human 
human health effects of PFAS has been conducted largely in connection with litigation. Um, you may have heard of the C8 study panel. The C8 study panel was the result of litigation involving DuPont and so a facility in West Virginia. Uh, there have been uh, a number of uh, illnesses or health conditions that have been connected to PFAS exposure. Um, there continue to be studies about potential connection with some of the uh, some of the cancers that have been alleged. I think a lot of these links right now are still theoretical, but the regulation is pushing out ahead of you know, the cancer research. When you're talking about how to regulate these products, how to regulate the chemicals, you have to look at the specific products that are issued. At issue. The, the products are really too numerous to, to talk about here. They are products that have been across all industries, across all types of uh, consumer products. Uh, and so the difficulty with getting them out of the environment is that they were put into the environment by all sorts of facilities, uh, in all sorts of habitats, and it's very difficult to build a filtration system that can remove them from that environment. So with all of that in mind, I want to turn it over to our panelists to talk about some of the specific class action issues that are arising. Thank you, Tom. I'm just going to stand up here, I think, uh, a little more clearly on the feet. Thank you all for uh, coming out this morning. Uh, so I'm going to talk about two areas of litigation concerning PFAS. Uh, secondly, I'm going to talk about class action cases focused on consumer products that contain PFAS. Uh, first, I'm going to uh, cover a, uh, a California-specific law called uh, Proposition 65. And uh, it's, it's very, I think it's appropriate for discussion today. It's very akin to a class action. Any person in the state of California can sue on behalf of all of the people in the state of California. And uh, litigation is incredibly robust under this statute. Uh, there's literally over 3,000 uh, Proposition 65 notices go out to businesses uh, uh, each year. So it's a really uh, uh, intense area of litigation. So this was a, a law that was a voter initiative. It was approved by voters back in 1986. And gained uh, more and more steam since then. It was uh, drafted originally by uh, an attorney from the Environmental Defense Fund, and it uh, has two primary objectives. Uh, one is, and, and really the, 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 the largest one, uh, is to inform people before the public, before they're exposed to uh, carcinogens or reproductive toxins. And, uh, and then secondly, to prohibit discharges of these chemicals to uh, sources of drinking water. Um, now, not all chemicals fall under Prop 65. A chemical has to be listed by the state of California that either cause cancer or be a reproductive toxin. There's a lot of dispute in the state of California as to the burden or the burden of proof that's needed to, for the state to identify uh, a chemical. Uh, on the list. And there's about 900 chemicals on the list, so it's a pretty broad uh, spectrum, but it's not all chemicals. And, and the point of it really is that the general public should receive reasonable and clear warnings before they're exposed to uh, listed chemicals. So who does it apply to? Well, any, any business, uh, doing business in the state of California or selling products, it's got more than 10 employees. Uh, is subject to it, and uh, I've often seen companies that have no employees in California. That doesn't matter if the company is located in another state. Sells products in California is going to be uh, all within the scope of this law. And uh, now the exposures under Prop 65 that activate liability, they uh, they're not alleged to have caused, or do, nor do they have to cause for liability any harm to anyone. It's just the fact that an exposure occurred, no matter how small the exposure is, 
and there was no warning beforehand. None of these cases is anybody alleging that they've actually suffered personal injuries. The types of exposures are uh, consumer product exposures, occupational exposures, environmental exposures, but really the focus is the consumer products. Uh, there's no question over 99% of these cases involve uh, the, the consumer products. So who enforces Proposition 65? Well, both the public prosecutors and the private prosecutors. And how the case starts out is a 60-day notice goes out, and the public prosecutors have that, that amount of time to file suit. If they do, then the private prosecutors can't uh, do anything with it. But uh, it virtually, the public prosecutors hardly ever uh, actually pursue these. So it's uh, here it's over 99% of it to file by private prosecutors. And again, this can be anybody, uh, any member of the public. And the law has what's called a bounty hunter provision, which provides uh, uh, an incentive for private prosecutors. And it unfortunately has spawned a, a whole cottage industry of plaintiff attorneys uh, in California that focus just on these Prop 65 cases. Uh, most of them lead to settlements. Uh, Virtually every settlement, over 95% of that, is going to the attorneys for attorney's fees and the investigation fees. So what are the potential penalties uh, if liability is found? Well, the statute is pretty vague, and it basically says up to $2,500 per exposure per day. And to give you an idea how the plaintiff's bar works this, is they will say if a company sells a particular product that's in violation, let's say it's 10,000 units in a year, the plaintiff's bar would say, well, that's 10,000 violations right there. Also, every time somebody would use this product in the course of the year, that's another exposure and another violation. So if your average consumer would use the product, say, 10 times a year, you add another zero to this list. But for just 10,000 violations, you know, that's up to $25 million. Now, this, if, when these cases go to trial, it's bench trials. It's a judge decides these cases, thank God, and not jurors. The judiciary out in California is well aware of this whole bounty hunter provision and the plaintiffs, of the enterprising plaintiffs' attorneys. So they generally, they, they don't go crazy in awarding penalties. But the uh, prospect of enormous penalties uh, is always used by the plaintiffs to drive settlements uh, as high as uh, they can get them. So what's significant for PFAS in Prop 65 is the chemicals are being added to the uh, listed chemicals uh, in California. And it started in 2017. PFOA, which my colleague Tom, you heard discuss PFOA and PFOS, they were added as reproductive toxins in 2017. 2021, uh, PFOS was, it was expanded to be a carcinogen, and, uh, and then a new one uh, was added, P PFNA, and uh, it was salts, it was added as a reproductive toxin, and it's continued in 2022 and 2021, I'm sorry, 2023. Um, we're considering even more of the PFAS chemicals to be added to the list. And you know, the way things are going, as more and more scientific data comes out, it may be that many more of these will be added uh, going forward. The types of products, um, you know, I, as Tom had indicated, that you know this this quality of being uh, moisture resistant that's common in a lot of these products. You see, you know, outer wear is a big target, uh, the baby beds and crib mattresses and because they're water resistant. And then there's a whole, a whole bunch of uh, you know, uh, very uh, common consumer products. The shower liners, you know, for the same purpose, and it, and it goes on and on. And there's uh, a whole world of products that have not yet been tagged by the plaintiff's bar, but I would expect probably will be. So how does a company avoid this Proposition 65 liability, whether it's for PFAS or you know, any other listed chemical? Well, first, uh, I think having a compliance policy. I, uh, it happens all the time that I get clients who, uh, and it tends to be smaller companies from out of state who are 
either not aware of Prop 65 or you just don't have a compliance policy. For litigation, that is terrible if the plaintiff finds out that they don't even have a policy, uh, which means they didn't, obviously didn't make an effort to comply with the law. <coughs> Um, it's important for a company to try to determine do they have chemicals that, or products that may have these chemicals that are suspect. You know, if you're selling products you know, with this moisture resistant quality, uh, that's, that's certainly a red flag. Communication with supply chain partners. For manufacturers, it's very important to determine you know, does your the products that you're manufacturing that get distributed to other countries contain these chemicals or any of the Prop 65 chemicals. Uh, you know, the liability is highest at the top of the chain and responsibility is highest at the top of the chain to inform the uh, companies downstream. And when manufacturers do inform their distributors, um, there's a, a large degree of protection from liability if they properly inform them and give them the warning information. But the distributor doesn't actually provide warnings. Conversely, for the uh, downstream companies, they should request that the manufacturers provide this information, let them know if there's any compliance issues. And, uh, and in that regard, some of them, uh, as I think a very good practice, uh, request uh, an agreement that you know, if the product's not found to be in compliance with the law, that the manufacturer will agree to identify or hold harmless uh, the company from any liability if an action is filed. Um, and in product testing, you know, if there is a suspicion that the product may contain these, you know, whether it's PFAS or other chemicals, to have that product's tested and find out. And then lastly, simply providing warnings. When you provide a warning, that's it. It's a, it puts you in the safe harbor as long as you use the proper warning. And uh, you won't be the subject of these actions because the plaintiff's bar has nothing to do with those products that have warnings. So I'm going to shift, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to shift gears now to class actions. We've seen a lot of class actions now filed over the last few years on concerning uh, consumer products with PFAS. And they tend to have the, the same common type claims and themes. Uh, the, the California Legal Remedies Act, CLRA, for short, is a very common one. It's a very plaintiff-friendly uh, statute. Uh, so that's oftentimes included in these unfair competition laws, which I think probably every state has. The idea that uh, if you don't provide information, if your product contains PFAS and it doesn't, there's no uh, information provided to the consumer that you're unfairly competing against other companies that maybe do not have these chemicals in the product. And then there's breach of express warranties and uh, unjust enrichment. You know, the idea here is that uh, the consumers would not have paid the price that they paid for these products had they known that PFAS was in the product. Uh, the types of products in focus, and it's kind of hard to see the, uh, the, the circle there, but I can tell you it's uh, uh, kind of the products we were talking about. Not, the uh, firefighting foams, that's, a, that's you know, one of the, I guess, probably the most significant source of, of PFAS uh, problems in the country how much is in those products, but uh, that there's a, a whole lot of other very common household products, as uh, Tom was telling you. And, uh, you know, food products tend to be the most common, uh, but just common household products, dental floss, cosmetics, uh, again, the outerwear. And the food products, we're seeing more and more class actions focused on food products. And uh, especially those that are marketed as being natural, healthy, and uh, recently there's been, I uh, saw Irish butter was a, a target, pomegranate juice, uh, they like to focus on, uh, especially on those products that consumers generally think of as being healthy, and uh, so this, all indications are that uh, this area of litigation is going to continue, and, and you know, we see it with other chemicals too, you, you may have seen it. In the news with uh, benzene and consumer products, there's been a lot of cases uh, in the last two years for class actions for that. And, uh, you know, the unfortunate thing is for businesses, these cases tend to be fodder for the press. They, they, the plaintiff's bar is well aware of that. They try to use that to uh, leverage settlements before the case gets filed. You know, so the companies are fearful of them being 
uh, put in the press after the case is filed. So uh, that's all I have. I will now pass it to uh, to Paul. Uh, thank you. Yeah, Brian. One thing I'd, I'd like to add is when you talk about uh, pre-litigation demands, a lot of the uh, statutes that these claims are ultimately filed under do provide some amount of pre-suit notice, like the CLRA. The Massachusetts General Law 93A and some others have a requirement that if you're going to sue for damages, you have to provide a 30-day window to remedy. And I, I think that you know we've talked about some of the individual settlements that you can infer from early dismissals of prejudice. I, I think there are probably a lot of cases that you never see at all filed uh, because defendants have resolved on an individual basis beforehand. So we, you know, when you're looking at the, the civil dockets. You're really not getting the whole picture of claims bar activity. No, I, absolutely, and the you know, same thing happens in Proposition 65. For every case that gets filed, there's probably at least ten that get settled. All right. Well, um, yeah, we're going to move on to sort of the, the growing trend for state and federal re regulation for PFAS. Um, but we're start with sort of the state approach. The states have been leading this in general. Um, states have not taken a uniform approach in the way they're regulating these things, um, but they do kind of fall into sort of, sort of two general categories. The first is, is sort of the warning label requirements, They're very much like the Prop 65 we were talking about before, making sure that there's a proper warning. But we're now also seeing uh, new uh, state laws that are banning uh, PFAS being intentionally added to uh, all classes of consumer products, most common being food packaging, children's toys, cosmetics. Um, you know, with the food packaging, the idea is that you, know, you get your greasy hamburger from the fast food restaurant. Um, it's, it, at least in the past, it's been PFAS that's kind of helped it not fall apart. Uh, pizza boxes, that kind of thing. And so um, the state's kind of taking the lead, and, and some states are in banning these things. And the leading edge, and really the most extreme, is Maine, who's banned um, the sale of products containing PFAS of any kind by the year 2030. And even starting this year in 2023, anyone selling products within the state is required to identify and, and quantify each PFAS that's been intentionally added to any product that's being sold. Um, this has caused a lot of problems for lots of companies because as, as we're going to talk about, it's really difficult to know if your product has PFAS in them. So in general, within the supply chain, uh, at each step, a lot of, of the suppliers of the materials don't know that they have PFAS in their materials. A lot of them don't understand exactly what PFAS is. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, it's referred to C8. Um, I, I saw one instance where some, one person was asking, they said, well, you know, we don't have any C8, you know, we don't have PFAS, we only have C6. Well, C6 is the replacement for, for C8. So, um, so this is the kind of thing a lot of times people don't know. Um, and then on top of that, because of these different patchworks of, of state laws, um, products end up uh, not violating one state, but they will if they're sold in another state. And so it's a real struggle once materials are entered the stream of commerce to ensure that uh, something doesn't end up in a state where it shouldn't be. And, and ultimately, we think because of these sort of patchwork laws, um, this is there's going to be sort of a, some low hanging fruit for class actions. Um, specifically, for example, a company that fails to keep up with the regulatory changes in, in any given state. Uh, insufficient labels and warnings, uh, inadequate testing to determine whether PFAS is present, um, failing to, to let the state know or failing to certify the contents. And then again, ultimately, the shipping it to the wrong state. And, and if you know there are some retailers, some actual retailers are taking the position that if it turns out that a particular product is going to not be able to be sold in a given state uh, because it's so difficult to keep it out and control the supply chain. In some instances, they're just going to stop selling that. Now, recently the federal government has gotten involved uh, and started uh, implementing or proposing regulations involving PFAS, but in a slightly different way, the federal government has been focusing on the, the science behind uh, the alleged public uh, health and environmental risks, and this is something that, uh, as the science has done more and more science, uh, there's a lot of push towards trying to define what exactly the, the threat that is being posed. And, a good example is the drinking water limits that have been proposed for PFOA and PFOS. Um, ultimately, the EPA and its uh, science advisory board concluded that uh, these two chemicals are probable carcinogens. 
And because of that, then, in drinking water, the goal uh, will then be set to zero. Uh, but because it's really hard to remove these materials, uh, the feasible limit so far is being set at four parts per trillion. And um, it's a really small amount. It's, it's very difficult to sort of conceptualize exactly how small this, this is. There's a lot of examples that get thrown around. Um, one example might be if the average American's lifespan is 75 years. Um, I'd say it's a blink of an eye, but it's actually not. It's about one, it's one thirtieth of a blink of an eye in the, in the total time frame. You know, one drop in a little bit of swimming pool. Um, there's all these different kinds of, of ways to do it. We, we have a hard time sort of understanding just how small that, that really is. In addition, um, EPA is also proposing changing Superfund laws, which is uh, CERCLA. They're going to start uh, attaching liability or potential liability for the presence of certain PFAS in the environment. Um, there's also movements within the EPA under TOSCA to ban the importation, manufacturing, and use, uh, not just of PFOA and PFOS, but also in general, all PFAS uh, use in commercial products. They're really trying to work that out. And it won't be long. Um, they're moving towards uh, limits on waste discharges. So that's uh, wastewater and the Clean Water Act uh, under uh, RICRA for, for disposal of solid wastes. So we're going to see uh, to get more and more uh, regulation, more requirements to remove these things to make sure that they don't continue adding out into the environment. So I want to talk then about sort of like the short term impacts and long-term trends, especially in terms of costs and class actions. So first of all, uh, this drive to remove PFAS from two products and, and the environment is going to cost the costs. Right now, there are not a lot of acceptable uh, replacement options for PFAS. So there's going to require expenditures to research new materials to replace them. That's going to drive up the costs. Um, also, just removing PFAS in general is going to be more costly. That's in part disposing of, of products that you can't sell because they contain PFAS. And also, there's the filtration and removal of PFAS from you know, water and, and, and waste and everything else we've talked about in terms of the environment that's already there. Um, and because of this, we think that we're going to start, at least initially, uh, there's a chance we're going to see some scarcity in some consumer goods. Like I said, some, some, some products will not be sold in certain states, and then retailers won't sell them. Or, or in Maine, for example, you might find a situation where there's just not a lot of stuff being sold because people can't certify that they actually meet the requirements for, for PFAS. We also think, though, that over time, uh, people are, I mean, it's already happening that people are becoming more and more savvy about the presence of PFAS in, in products. And because of these regulatory changes, uh, we expect that, that although there will be an uptick in, in lawsuits because of the presence of PFAS, on the other hand, there will be a, a slow march of PFAS out of, the, out of the supply chain, which will make it uh, harder and harder and be fewer and fewer lawsuits about uh, PFAS content, PFAS violation of the laws we discussed. That's a pretty long tail, though, I assume. But we, yeah, it, it will be. Um, it, part of the problem right now is we've talked about PFO and PFOS. These are sort of like the, the big ticket things, and they've been around for decades and decades. But you know, we have replacements like Gen X, um, and now we have replacements for replacements. And, um, because there's just like thousands and thousands of these compounds, um, when, when one thing gets regulated, then something replaces it, and it, it's very difficult to figure out where all these things are and know exactly what you have, especially in the low quantities we're talking about. So uh, in addition to the long-term tail of the lawsuits, uh, an even longer challenge is going to be simply removing the PFAS that's already out there. So in the environment, um, landfills and everything else, to try to sort of contain it and, and try to figure out what to do with it. Who to pay for it? it exactly. Um, now, just up here, just, I'm not, I'm not going through all this. Just to give you a flavor, these are some of the state bans that were proposed. Um, like I said, food packaging happens a lot, um, but different states are taking different approaches. You see time frames, you know, 2023, 2024. We have May 2030, all products. Um, but different states are sort of a marching uh, set of deadlines for moving people. I mean, it's not every state, obviously, um, but you are seeing a, a general trend that's moving forward. There's also a push on the federal level for, um, you know, in, in the Congress to establish the sort of limits as well, limits on Department of Defense purchases, um, you know, lots of different things moving forward there. Right? With that, that's the agenda. Uh, I'd like to talk about a few trends in 
test litigation. Um, rather than talk about the large swath of cases across the country, I want to focus on, on two particular cases, but before we get to that, um, kind of general categories of litigation. Um, Brian and Paul touched on uh, the consumer products litigation. Um, we're also seeing med medical monitoring class actions. So these are uh, actions where plaintiffs are either alleging personal injury or um, alleging simply exposure or the presence of um, the presence of, of PFAS in, in their body or in their bloodstream um, that leads to an increased risk of, of disease or illness. Um, so again, the, the specific injury may may not be alleged for these types of claims. Um, and then broadly speaking, we're seeing environmental litigation. So these are um, claims that are generally revolve around the contamination of uh, drinking water, either private or public drinking water sources, uh, typically from um, industrial uh, contamination or uh, from contamination from other sort of sources um, like firefighting foam. Um, so those claims have been brought by individual residents of communities from private and public water utilities um, and also by state uh, states and municipalities. Um, against PFAS manufacturers, there have been brought against uh, manufacturers of products that incorporate PFAS, um, intermediate products, um, and, and, and different locations of property owners where, where there is, has been contamination. Um, so the, the claim for alleging personal injury, medical monitoring, uh, property damage, environmental remediation, and cleanup on common law theories of negligence, uh, public nuisance, product defect, uh, but also um, in the case of, of government entities, uh, natural resources statutes. Um, so between you know, medical monitoring and environmental litigation, the, the most notable um, early case of this was the C8 litigation that, that, that Tom mentioned. That established a, a science panel that uh, concluded that there was a probable link between uh, PFAS exposure and uh, six different different health conditions. Um, so the the health condition that that, that panel established have, have shaped uh, class action litigation um, moving, moving beyond that 2005 uh, settlement. Um, a subset of environmental litigation is this AFFF <coughs> litigation. That's, that's aqueous uh, film forming foam. It's a, a firefighting foam. Um, and we'll talk about uh, the multi district litigation related to, to those claims in a moment. Uh, but first, let's uh, touch on the Hardwick class action. So, this is a medical monitoring class action. It, it was originally filed in 2018 um, against PFAS manufacturers as part of the uh, C8 MDL in the Southern District of Ohio. Uh, plaintiff is not alleging uh, any particular disease or, or physical injury. Rather, um, he is a veteran firefighter um, who alleges that over the, the course of his 40-year career um, was exposed to PFAS primarily through uh, firefighting foam. Um, he's seeking to represent a nationwide class of individuals with um, detectable levels of PFAS in their bodies. Um, and now given that um, some ex experts estimate that 95% of the United States po population has detectable levels of PFAS in, in their bloodstream, um, he's not only seeking to represent a nationwide class, but he's essentially, uh, it, it's a nationwide class in the most literal sense of the term. So almost everyone in the United States. Um, so a very, a very broad ranging uh, class action. Uh, he is not seeking uh, specific monetary damages, rather he is seeking medical monitoring and the establishment of a, of a science panel. Um, and uh, so just, just seeking equitable relief here. Um, in March of last year, the Southern District of, of Ohio um, actually certified a class uh, on a more limited basis than plaintiff was seeking. Um, it was individuals subject to the laws of Ohio, that's the, the language that was used, um, and uh, that have uh, 0 0.05 uh, parts per trillion of, um, of PFOA um, and uh, 0 0.05 parts per trillion of any other PFAS in, in, their, in their bloodstream. Um, so the subject of the laws of Ohio was, was sort of the limiting factor on that class certification. The, the, the judge uh, invited briefing on a broader scope um, of the class certification, uh, potentially to uh, citizens of states who uh, states that uh, acknowledge a medical monitoring claim. So that's not every state, um, 
but, but it's, a, it's a broad swath of states. Um, and, and given the language of the order, that could even be expanded potentially nationwide, you know, even to, um, into, to states that don't acknowledge uh, medical monitoring or organized medical monitoring as a different way. Now, that um, order is on, on appeal to the Sixth Circuit. Um, the Sixth Circuit did grant interlocutory review of the class certification decision, um, and it has not reached a decision on, on the review, but I'll, I'll read you it. Uh, an excerpt from the order granting the, the review, uh, which certainly expressed some skepticism of the district court's order. Um, they said, we hold merely that when a district court certifies one of the largest class actions in history, predicated on a questionable theory of standing and a refusal to apply a cohesion requirement endorsed by seven courts of appeals, to authorize pursuit of an ill-defined remedy that sits uneasily with traditional constraints on the equity power and threatens massive liability, such a decision warrants further review. Um, so uh, skepticism, to say the least, uh, we expect to see at least some limitation on um, the class certification that arose out of our way. Um, uh, but again, this is uh, such a, a, a broad, uh, sweeping class action, and again, one that does not allege actually any particular, particular inj uh, injury, but rather merely exposure, um, it, it will certainly be one. Um, next, I want to talk about uh, HFLF. So uh, this is a, an aqueous film-forming foam. This is a firefighting suppressant um, that is used to fight liquid, uh, fl flammable liquid fires. So these are class B liquid fuel fires from jet fuel, uh, petroleum, gasoline. It was first developed um, as in, a, in a partnership between 3M and the Navy in the 60s. Um, and it contains a foaming agent and then a PFAS-based fluorosurfactant, which is um, basically what makes the foam effective. So it works by both cooling and suppressing the fire. The foam sits on top of, of the liquid fire um, and cools it and, and uh, suppresses the fire and it also creates a barrier that stops the fire uh, from, from spreading. Um, so military bases are, are common um, sites. Uh, manufacturing facilities, airports, uh, oil refineries, oil tankers, offshore platforms. Um, so in addition to those facilities, you're also seeing uh, local fire departments testing uh, the use of the foam. Um, so public and private water supplies near uh, these various facilities um, have seen PFAS contamination of their water that they attribute to uh, the foam leaching into the, the nearby soil. My experts have, have suggested that HFLF is the, the single largest contributor to PFAS water contamination in the country. So um, this has given rise to uh, numerous lawsuits um, in jurisdictions across the United States. Um, both the Department of Defense and manufacturers of these products, so we're seeing both manufacturers of the, the PFAS core product and then uh, manufacturers of the foam that incorporates PFAS, um, are looking for alternatives, uh, PFAS-free or fluorine-free foams. You might, you might see that sort of language. Um, they're uh, looking into research and development of these products. As of yet, they have yet to find something that is um, as effective as AFFF in fighting these potentially catastrophic fires or that meet some of the requirements. Um, for instance, uh, the FAA has specific rules related to airports for, for suppressing these sorts of fires. Um, and we have not seen a product yet that complies with, with those regulations. Um, so as I mentioned, there are, are many cases across the country that uh, allege uh, contamination as a result of, of uh, HRLF leaching into the soil. Um, there are over 3,000 cases um, and, and growing as part of this MDL in um, the District of South Carolina. Um, and the general allegations across these cases are that, that Atria Triple F contributed to groundwater contamination. Um, you are seeing claims by uh, public utilities and other water providers. We're seeing medical monitoring class actions. We're seeing uh, property owners alleging that their, their property value was diminished as a result of the contamination. Uh, attorney general actions and traditional personal injury claims. Uh, so these, um, th these cases are proceeding on a bellwether basis, um, and the, the MDL has grouped the claims into different sorts or different categories of claims. Um, so the first category that is, is going to trial are water provider cases. 
Um, now, the, these are public water, uh, public utilities and other water sources that have alleged uh, contamination. Um, the, the judge presiding over the MDL decided that there were simpler causation issues related to water provider cases, and he, he also indicated that he didn't think that if, if these water utility cases couldn't move forward, he, he expressed some skepticism that the other types of cases could, could move along as well. He also thought that uh, these water cases had a, had a bit of bigger impact on, uh, on public health. Um, the first Bellwether water provider case is actually in a good trial um, in just a few weeks on June 5th. Um, so this is based out of the city of Stewart, Florida. They're alleging that um, their fire and rescue um, use of uh, HFLF in training exercises contributed to uh, water pollution or contamination of their, of their drinking water sources. Um, they're alleging that they had to switch to a, a different source of water and that they also will need to uh, create a, a water filtration system that is capable of filtering out PFAS. There are three different types of water filtration systems that um, have been shown to be effective in filtering PFAS. Um, so it's reverse osmosis, granular, uh, activated carbon, and anion exchange. Um, these are all expensive um, facilities. Um, so this municipalities are, are looking to recover the costs of creating these uh, these new filtration systems from uh, manufacturers of PFAS and manufacturers in, in this situation of, of uh, the phones themselves. Um, so this is not a class action, but it certainly will be a case to watch going forward given the, the issues that the court is, is looking into. Um, they uh, eventually issue this uh, tracking the contamination in the in the city or in the, in the public water source to specific manufacturers and different types of, of PFAS. Um, novel issues of uh, uh, defense contractor uh, immunity um, and, and, and various other uh, scientific analysis related to the uh, tracing of, of different sources of PFAS. Uh, the next level of bellwether cases, and we don't expect to see this for, for some time, but they, they're parties are beginning discovery soon are these leach claim bellwether cases. So leach claim comes from the, um, the CA MDL panel that again Tom mentioned. Uh, so these are the, the uh, health conditions that the science panel in that litigation found had probable links to PFAS exposure. Um, so these cases in, in the AFFF MDL are going to be limited to, to some of the, these leach injuries. So kidney cancer, testicular cancer, ulcerative, ulcerative colitis, uh, thyroid disease. Uh, they may discuss uh, pregnancy-induced hypertension. Um, the parties are, are disputing that right now. Um, the, the court has excluded high cholesterol as the other leach claim, uh, given its general prevalence in the population. Uh, the parties are also discussing which sites should, should be the focus of discovery related to these personal injury claims. So Willow Grove, uh, Pennsylvania, will certainly be one of the uh, locations. Um, the parties are debating whether Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado will also be one of the locations of, of potential injuries. Um, so again, as the discovery process uh, unfolds and uh, the court continues to narrow the, the cases that will proceed to, to trial, um, this is going to be another set of cases uh, to watch that will have uh, impactful You know, one thing I want to mention, uh, there's, a, there's a question in the prior panel about whether something that's we're moving towards 23B2 certification as opposed to 23B3. And while that may not be true for the consumer claims, because of some of the problems associated with standing or uh, injunctive relief, uh, I think, you know, given Hardwick and others, you probably see that more in, re in the PFAS context, I would think because there is a, there's an avenue for injunctive relief um, that may be simpler than trying to uh, craft some sort of damages remedy for uh, you know, punitive classes that have uh, really a, a very wide-ranging array of personal injuries. Um, you know, I don't know if, uh, if, Paul, you have some thoughts on what uh, a remediation strategy would look like um, that could be characterized as injunctive relief in, in some of these cases. 
Yeah, so this, the challenge basically is that in most instances it's a filtration system. Um, and so there's uh, the long term costs associated with not with just the installation, but also the replacement of the, the media once it's, once it's reached its capacity. Um, so there is, there's sort of an ongoing sort of uh, requirement for, for that. Um, it's, uh, it has been, it's been um, in some states, uh, manufacturers are required to provide uh, alternative water supplies, you know, piping in water to people living in the country for municipal sources as well. So those are the, the kinds of, of, of uh, solutions that are being proposed. I mean, one, one interesting thing about this litigation is that you have a lot of, of very viable defendants for the time being. You know, the, the defendants who you see most often in these cases are 3M, DuPont, and, and some similar companies. And so where in some environmental litigation you may have some, some, very, uh, some very old claims of contamination and, and there may be any number of entities that aren't around anymore. Here, um, you're seeing a, a lot of defendants in some of these cases. And I would just add, Tom, that uh, if it becomes the final EPA rule that uh, PFAS is added as a hazardous substance to the CERCLA uh, uh, litigation, you know, that door is going to be really busted open even larger. But, uh, as I'm sure you guys know, it's, uh, you know, we sometimes get hundreds of defendants in a CERCLA case. Each company that contributed a little bit is potentially liable. Can we answer any, any questions that one has? Wrap up? All right. Well, thank you all very much for your time today. I really appreciate it, the opportunity to talk with you all. Thank you. Thank you.